Okay, hello, good afternoon. So uh, today uh, we're going to go over um, some points from Nagel and Jackson. And it, actually just in doing this course, it really uh, has come to seem to me that a lot of the basic problems here are about a kind of tension between imagination, recognizing the uh, centrality of imagination in our ordinary thinking about the mind, um, and physicalism, the idea that physics gives you complete coverage of what's there in the world. Um, excuse me. <laughs> in, lo <laughs> in lots of different ways, um, what keeps coming up is that we seem to have imaginative understanding of a sector of reality of the mind in particular. And uh, physicalism doesn't seem to make sense of why we need imagination to understand that sector of the world. If physics is the whole truth about everything, then surely all understanding of the world is ultimately physical understanding. So why would you need empathy or an imaginative ability to project yourself into someone else's shoes in order to understand what's going on with their mind. But that does seem to be the case. So today I want to um, try to set out one way of trying to uh, reconcile these two. I'm not at all sure that it's convincing, but let me try it on you. Um, uh, next week, uh, we start up in on personal identity, the identity of the self, with those readings from Locke and Williams on Tuesday and Thursday. But I want to start out with um, the question, well, what is physicalism? If we're going to think about uh, what the idea that the world is purely physical um, has to do with imagination, then let's start out by just saying a bit more about what it takes for physicalism to be true for it to be true that it's just one world and it's a physical world. So we've had three ways so far in the class of saying what physicalism is. So um, the way we started out with Descartes was physicalism says there's only one kind of stuff, physical stuff. What's the opposite of physicalism? Dualism, very good. <laughs> That's sorry, warning. <laughs> Dualism, um, dualism being the view that there's two kinds of stuff, right? Um, physical stuff and mental stuff. Um, uh, another way of stating it, when you have a model like water is H2O, lightning is discharge of electricity, um, pain is C fiber firing, the idea there is every time you've got a psychological state like pain, you can find some physical state that's identical to it. Um, so that property of being in pain is the same as the property of having C fiber firing. Being angry will be having a particular configuration of your amygdala, something like that. So maybe you could do that for every particular mental property. And then Jackson had still another way of saying what physicalism is. Jackson's formulation was, all the correct information is physical information. If you get all the correct physical information, then you've got all the uh, correct information that there is. And that seems different. It's hard, to, it's hard to know exactly what the difference is, but they all seem different, right? And if you say that all the mental properties are physical properties, presumably you're going to think there's only one kind of stuff. But if you thought that the mental properties were different to the physical properties, would that mean you thought there were two kinds of stuff? No? Put your hand up if your hunch is no. Very good. I think that's the right answer. Um, if you think the right, if the right answer is yes. I actually forgot what the question is at this point. Um, let's see, what was the question? Um, if you think that the, there are two kinds of properties, mental properties and physical properties, and those are different, does that mean you think there are two kinds of stuff? No. I mean, there might be just one kind of stuff with two kinds of properties. So, <laughs> stop me if this is getting too technical. Uh, it, is that all right? There could be one kind of stuff with just two kinds of properties sticking out of it, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Um, and then Jackson, so these are different ways of saying what physicalism is. And then Jackson says, 
this is a different formulation. He says all the correct information is physical information. So that's different, right? And just to um, say the kind of thing that I have going through my head uh, when I see this stuff, um, there's only one kind of stuff, physical stuff, I mean, I don't think that's actually a very good way to set things up because it makes it seem like if there's problems with um, the idea that the mind is physical, we could solve them by postulating ectoplasm, a second kind of stuff. But um, if you really think that the problems about, um, um, if you think that the problems about seeing how the mind can be physical are problems about reconciling an imaginative view-pointed understanding of the world with an objective understanding of the world, then ectoplasm is just giving you more objective stuff. It's not really helping. So that actually doesn't seem like a very good way to, to, to set up the question. Um, if you say that every mental property is identical to some physical property, then that, the problem there is variable realizability, right? You say pain is C fiber firing, but here we have an octopus clearly in pain, but no C fibers, no C fiber firing. So pain can't be C fiber firing. That, 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 that was the point about variable realizability. Yeah. Um, you don't get that one one map from mental properties onto physical properties, because for any mental property, there's a whole bunch of different physical properties a thing could have and still have that mental property. Is, it, is that familiar? I hope that's familiar rather than something you forgot long ago. Is, yeah, you, you, you can pause me. Does that make perfect sense? Okay. Um, so what about this way of setting it up? All the correct information is physical information. Jackson doesn't discuss this formulation of physicalism very much. He just says that's what physicalism is. And then he gets on with giving this example of Mary, um, who's got all the physical information but doesn't know about the colors. Um, but putting in, th th that's what makes his example um, so powerful, because she seems clearly to be getting new information, um, although she already, when she sees the, the world of color, although she already had all the physical information. But that notion of information, that this really came up in the discussion. You guys brought out a lot of this in the discussion. It, you have to make a contrast between getting information about some new aspect of the world, as opposed to getting information about something you already knew a lot about, but getting it in some new format. Yeah, someone had the example of romantic love, right? You've read a whole lot about it in theory, but now, you ha now it has you in its throes. Um, in a sense, you're not really learning anything there. You're just getting um, the old information in a new format. Information about all this old stuff that you knew about it already is getting you in a new way. You see what I mean? So does that make sense? So if Jackson uh, says, well, Mary is getting new information, we don't really know yet. Is she getting information about some new sector of reality when she steps out into the world of color? Or is it that she's, get, she's just getting information about the same old things that she knew about already, but it's a new format for the information? So let me just go over that notion of a format. Um, and I don't mean anything very technical here. All I mean is um, if someone tells you all about their trip to um, 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 outer Mongolia, and, uh, if someone tells you all about it, then you can get pretty much the same information from them telling you about it in great detail as you get from being there and feeling the wind on your back as a thunderstorm sweeps across the plains. Um, so when you're there, you're not necessarily finding out anything that was new to that you didn't know about before. You're saying, yes, this is just what she told me it would be like. I knew it was going to be like this. Um, so you're getting, uh, uh, you're, not, you're not getting information about new stuff here. You're just getting the information in a new format when you're actually there. Or if you look at a photograph and you say, well, yeah, that's just the way it was described to me. Or there could be fairly trivial changes in format, like get, getting it in lowercase text 
as opposed to using block capitals the whole way through. So is that reasonably intuitive, that idea of different formats you could get the knowledge in, whether it's what kind of type you're using, or whether it's reading it or getting a photograph, or whether it's being told about it or being there. Yeah? It could be the same stuff you're hearing about in different formats. OK, so I want to have that notion to uh, uh, that notion of a format in place, a format of information. And then now here, here's another new friend, um, supervenience. Supervenience? We haven't talked about supervenience, have we? You guys are usually way ahead of me in everything I say. So <laughs> I just want to take pleasure in this moment for a, mo <laughs> for a, for a little. <laughs> but OK, here is a new friend, supervenience. Um, this is actually uh, probably the standard way that philosophers have of saying what physicalism is nowadays. It says, suppose two possible worlds are the same in all physical respects. Then they're the same in all psychological respects. In fact, then they're the same in every respect, whatever. So um, the, uh, physicalism says if you uh, fixed all the physical facts, then you fixed all the facts there are. So again, here are some little green friends. Um, here are all the possible worlds. Um, so there are different ways things could have been, right? Um, if you, as you sit here, are thinking, by God, I wish I'd taken astrophysics, um, <laughs> then I wouldn't have to be um, sitting through all this stuff about schizophrenia or God knows what. Um, I could be finding out about the origins of the universe. Um, then what you're talking about here is, well, you're talking about what could have happened, what would have happened if only I'd done things differently, um, or what, mi uh, uh, um, what, what might happen in the future. So it, it, it's, you're not asking questions about um, what could have happened so far as I know. I mean, if you, sometimes when you say that something's possible, if you say, if I'm saying to you, well, where is Bill? And you say it's possible he's in the cafe. Uh, what you mean is so far as I know, he's in the cafe, right? But if you're sitting there thinking, I could have taken astrophysics. It's not that you're thinking, hey, maybe I did take astrophysics. Maybe this really is an astrophysics class. Do you see what I mean? If I'm thinking, um, boy, I wish I'd called in sick uh, this morning so I didn't have to take this, l give this lecture. I could have been in a bus out of town, uh, right? If I'm uh, uh, consumed with regret there, it's not that I'm thinking, hey, maybe I am in a bus out of town. Do you see what I mean? The whole poignancy is, um, I could have done it, but it's manifest to me that I didn't. You see what I mean? I mean, these guys always know what I'm going to say before I say it anyway, so why? <laughs> what is the profit? I could have been in that bus, right? So when you talk about worlds here, when I talk about worlds here, um, these are all ways things could have been, whether I know it or not, right? I mean, um, um, even if I know that this is, See, one, one of these worlds is a special. One of these worlds has got an A on it. Can you guess why it has an A on it? That's where we are. That's right. That's the actual world, right? That's here, right? Uh, that's what's actually going on. All these other worlds are non-actual. They're ways things could have been. So when you express regret or relief, um, you're saying, boy, when I express regret, I'm saying, um, that possible world is much better than the one I'm actually in. Yeah? Or when you express relief, you're saying, hey, there's that world over there that um, in which just terrible things happened to me, but thank God I'm in this world. You see what I mean? Yeah. Um, so that's possible worlds. I mean, I put it in kind of emotional terms, but um, the, 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 anyway, they are emotionally important. Um, OK. Uh, so we're talking about what could have happened, even though you know it didn't, as opposed to what could have happened so far as you know, right? Regret relates to what could have happened, even though you know it didn't. So we've got three ways of formulating physicalism. There's only one kind of stuff, physical stuff. The only properties of physical properties are Jackson's. The uh, all correct information is physical information. So supervenience says, 
suppose you've got two of these possible worlds, and suppose that in two of these possible worlds, all the physical facts are the same. All the microphysics is the same. All the facts about the basic forces in the universe are the same. Um, everything like that is the same in these two worlds. Then are all, the, are all facts whatever the same in those two worlds? Does it follow? This is your question. OK, let me re repeat the question. There are all the microphysical facts about this world. There are all the facts about the atoms or gluons or whatever they are. Uh, what are gluons made of? Are gluons made of something? Does anybody know? <laughs> are there any physics guys in here? Well, take it from me that, that, <laughs> that gluons are the basic building blocks of the universe. Right? There are these fundamental particles, and there are these fundamental forces, and there are the facts about the way they are arrayed in this world. Yeah? So suppose you take another world in which all the basic microphysical facts are exactly the same. In that world, does everyone have the same psychological states? Does it follow that they have the same psychological states? Put your hand up if you think the answer is yes. Very good. <laughs> and a, a lot of somewhat hesitant. <laughs> and put your hand up if you think the answer is no. Wow, OK, that's uh, slightly more yes than no, but not much in it, I would have said. OK, did anyone care to explain their answer? Yeah? Oh, very good. Right, right. We need, we need, <laughs> we need one here. Yeah. Uh -huh. It seems to say like everything is the same in both worlds, except the most basic principle in modern quantum mechanics uh -huh. is that even if everything is the same, yes. all particles will move according to probabilities after that point. Right. So after the instant, like instant, it's very good. After yeah. The new world is created, right. Right, there, there, there could be some indeterminacy in how, how it goes. You fix all the basic physical facts about the universe at one time, and it might unfold differently in different possible worlds later. Is, is that right? Is, is that what you're saying? Yeah. No, that's absolutely fair enough. Um, but OK, so in those terms, let, let me, I, 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 I didn't say anything really explicitly about time here. But suppose we say that two, we have two worlds here that are exactly the same in respect of all the basic physical facts over a long period of time. Yeah. I mean, that could happen. And that is possible. Yeah. Um, uh, so suppose you've got two where everything did, in fact, unfold in the same way over a period of time. Then the question is, over that period of time, are all the psychological states of people in the two worlds uh, the same? Like if you have a headache, I mean, since all the basic physical facts about the two worlds are the same, then there's someone in this world, uh, there's you in this world, and there'll be someone at any rate who looks exactly like you in this world, yeah, because they're particle for particle identical to you, yeah. Um, so if you've got a headache, will your counterpart here have a headache? Yeah, does it just follow? That's the question I'm asking. G again, can you put your hand up if you think the answer is yes, with that helpful clarification? Uh, OK, and if you think the answer is no, OK, I think if I keep repeating it, the nose will keep going down. <laughs> OK, anyone who speak up for the nose is, yeah? Are you kind of the same physical properties, or like things are happening at the same time? Uh, the same physical, uh, you, for every fundamental particle, um, for every fundamental um, uh, space-time point, um, you, you've got a corresponding one in the other world with exactly the same physical properties. So it's the same thing twice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the same thing twice. I mean, you, if you've got a, a place here, you've got a place there, and if this place has got electric charge on it, that place has got that same electric charge on it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the, the person in the, the person who's like kind of like me. Yes. Yeah. That's right. They've had the exact same history, yes. What, there's no distinction, right? There's no distinction physically. The question is, does it follow that there's no distinction mentally? OK, so I'm not trying to, 
it's not exactly that I'm trying to persuade you of anything here. It's that if physicalism is true, then it does follow. Do, do you see what I mean? It's a way of stating what physicalism is. I myself just b find it very hard to believe that's not true. I, I mean, just to, <laughs> just to be played with you. But um, if you ask for a proof of this, Jackson, please. Uh, well, uh, Uh, well, I have a slide that says that's not so, so. If you endorse, there would be like law like connections between uh, what's happening in the physical and then that causes in a law like way what's happening in the mental. So you'd have a separation between physical stuff, but if you fix the physical stuff, it's going to always cause the same. Uh, All right. Okay. Um, well, what I was thinking was I, I see what you're saying. You could have the. Uh, physical stuff and the mental stuff, and when you fix the physical stuff, that causes the mental stuff to be uh, the same. Yeah, you could say that. I agree, and a lot of dualists would say that kind of thing. I think. Well, um, not a, maybe not a Cartesian dualist, but you have uh, some kind of dualist. Right, but remember, we're talking here about possible worlds. Yeah. Now, how many possible worlds are there? Five, ten. A lot, <laughs> yes, a real lot. I mean, usually people say there are infinitely many possible worlds, right? Um, so this is only a small sample, yeah? And as you can see, um, some of them are nearer to the actual world than others, right? If, if I'm cycling down the, um, down the lane here and you come sweeping by me in your car and I say, you nearly knocked me off my bike, I say indignantly, then that's to say there's a world in which you knocked me off my bike and it's really close to this one. And if you say, I was nowhere near you, um, you were perfectly safe the whole time, you're going to admit that it's logically possible that I get knocked off my bike. But that world, you say, boy, that's way out here, right? Uh, that, 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 that couldn't easily have happened. You see what I mean? So some of the worlds are closer in than others. Um, so Jackson's point is, if you take two close in worlds, that's, and you say, all the physical facts are the same. That means all the mental facts are the same too, uh, because the, mental, the physical facts are going to cause the mental facts to be the same. Um, that's fair enough, but physicalism, kind of full strength physicalism says, all you have to do is fix the physical facts. Now, there might be some causal process by which the physical facts generate the mental facts, but there's going to be a possible world in which that process doesn't work. Something interferes with the causation of the mental facts by the physical facts. And then you have two worlds that have got all the same mental facts, all the same physical facts, but different mental facts. Am I going too fast? Is, okay. Plain as day? Is, is, is that okay? Is, so, I mean, part of, the, part of the pleasure of this way of formulating physicalism actually is that once you get the basic idea, you can see lots of different ways you could jig it. So Jackson's way would suggest saying, I think there's a kind of physicalism that says, as long as you've got two nearby worlds, two kind of sensible worlds, not worlds where cows suddenly speak or turn into gas um, or become neutron stars, um, you, you see what I mean? Not, not kind of sensible worlds. Then um, uh, if you fix all the physical facts, you fix all the mental facts. But the way I'm formulating physicalism is just the simple full strength version that says if you've got any two possible worlds at all, however strange, however weird, however remote, um, then if you fixed all the physical facts, you fixed all the mental facts. So in that way of looking at it, um, uh, there couldn't be two kinds of stuff, physical and mental. Because you could fit, if there were two kinds of stuff, you could fix all the physical facts, but what's going on with the mental stuff is something else. So there'll be some possible world in which you get the same physical stuff, but you don't get the same mental stuff. And if you say, um, well, suppose you remember uh, the kind of physicalist that says, pain is just C-fiber firing, the central state materialist. If you're a central state materialist and you say stuff like pain is just C-fiber firing, are you going to think the supervenience is true? Put out your hand if you think the answer is yes. OK, if you say pain is just C-fiber firing, that's all there is to being in pain. And then you'd fix all the facts about C-fiber firing. 
Have you thereby fixed all the facts about whether people are in pain? Put up your hand if you think the answer is yes. Well, that is the correct answer. Very good. <laughs> right. um, if you think the answer is no. <laughs> not, not that I'm trying to prejudice you. <laughs> um, well, I, I, I'm, not, I, I'm not quite sure I can explain it any more fully. But look, if pain is just the same thing as sea fiber firing, then if you set all the sea fiber firing facts, then you thereby have fixed all the facts about who's in pain and who isn't. I mean, there's nothing more to fix. You see what I mean? So, so but um, suppose you've got variable realizability. Suppose you've got octopuses who've got pain but not sea fiber firing. Well, it's, could it still be true that if you fix all the physical facts, you thereby fix all the mental facts? Yes, it could. Very good, yes. Uh, <laughs> some people at the front were nodding <laughs> intelligently. <laughs> so, um, um, does that make sense? Uh, th these are very simple points. If, I'm, uh, if it doesn't seem completely clear, I'm, not, I'm just not explaining it very well. Um, but if you say there are lots of different ways of having pain, lots of different physical ways, there's what the octopuses have, there's the sea fibers, there's um, what the Martians with silicon-based body chemistries have. There are all these different ways of physically being in pain. Um, so you can't define pain as sea fiber firing. Um, it could still be true that your physics completely fixes whether you're in pain. You see what I mean? So this is a, uh, that's part of what is so pleasing about this definition of physicalism. Now then, Mary. Um, the question about Mary is, Mary's got all the physical information about the physical characteristics of the actual world. Mary knows all that stuff. But are there still different possible worlds about which that physical information could be true? That's to say, Mary knows all the physical facts, but are there different possible worlds um, where people have different kinds of mental lives consistent with Mary having all that physical information. So here's Mary sitting in the actual world. She's got all this knowledge about the physics of her world. Um, now in this world, people have one kind of psychology. They have one kind of color experiences. but. Are there going to be other possible worlds where the physics is all just the same, but the mental lives of people are quite different? Yeah, you, you see what I mean? Yeah. Um, so if that's possible, if that could happen, um, that the physical information could be fixed, but all the mental stuff be quite different, then physicalism, the way I formulated it, is false. And Mary's finding out about some new sector of reality when she finds out about the colors. Again, this, every individual point I'm making here is very simple, so keep pausing me if, if any of it, just if I don't explain any, something quite clearly here. Yep. They're physically set up in exactly the same way. Yeah. We assume that all the physical information is complete. Um, and correct, yep. And if there are any indeterminacies, I mean, as you, as you said, there are indeterminacies, we just factor them in. We, we just build in we, which way it went. Yep, yep. Uh, are you saying that Mary learned something from the other world as well? Uh, well, <coughs> does she learn something new when she learns that it's this world rather than this one that she's in? I mean, that's not a very good way to put it. Um, it, it, she's got all the physical information. So the question is, are there worlds in which the physical information is the same, but the mental lives of people are different? Yeah. Physicalism says no. Yeah. So there's a sense in which Mary's got nothing left to learn once she's got all the physical facts in, because that completely determines which world she's in. On the other hand, if the psychological life can vary, even if the physical stuff is all fixed, then Mary does have some new fact to learn. Th does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, do we know if it's like if it's 
actually know there's nothing different in the other worlds than in the other worlds. That doesn't, doesn't that, does that necessarily mean also that like if someone could believe in something other than just like physical stuff, but uh, for like a viewer that it has to be the same, it has to be different than the other world? Like, isn't it possible that you can be like, you can believe in a partial consciousness yes. or like whatever, and still have things play out the exact same way in the other world just because like they're physically designed the same? Like, that doesn't. No, it's not at all meant to disprove the existence of consciousness. Yeah, uh, n nobody on the board here, as it were, n nobody we're considering, is denying the existence of consciousness. We will later in the term discuss people who deny the existence of consciousness, but that's ki <laughs> that's kind of an advanced topic. <laughs> and we haven't got that got there yet. Yeah. Um, so everybody here agrees consciousness exists. The issue is, given it exists, is it physical? Yeah. And at the moment, what we're just trying to do is pause in the question, what does it mean to say it's physical? Yeah. And if, it's, if it's physical, um, yeah. is it still like the monkey on the side that like, can't see anything about physical? Ah. Or is it like... Very good. Because like, if, if they have different mental like, positions, but they're, like, everything is physically the same in yes. both worlds, um, does this like, disprove that like, mental capabilities have any Okay, not for the first time you guys are making the point I was about to come on to. <laughs> that um, um, if you say, uh, I can have possible worlds where um, all the physics is the same, but the conscious life is different, then that really does seem to lead you to the monkey and the tiger. Um, because the, fi the clockwork of the physical world just keeps relentlessly unrolling. Um, in all these different possible worlds. So everything goes on just exactly the same. The variation in the conscious life is not something um, that's making any difference to what happens. Yeah. People sometimes put that by saying there's causal closure of the physical. If you, um, if you think of a billiard table with lots of balls rolling about on it, um, then you can look at how all the balls causally affect each other, right? They knock each other about. And then sometimes a force comes from outside, a billiard cue, boing, and makes a ball spring into action, even though no other ball hit it. Yeah? So the billiard table is not a closed system. There are kind of inputs of energy from outside. Um, the question th 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 then is, is the, is the physical, is the brain a closed system like that? Well. The physical is a closed system because we have all these laws of the conservation of energy. If there was really a mind outside the system that was causally active, then it should be able for the mind to come in like a billiard cue and prod a neuron into life, for example, where, when there was no physical cause of that at all. Yeah, the, suddenly the neuron starts firing. No physical cause. And not because it's indeterministic, it's because this jab came from outside, from the ectoplasm. Yeah? Now, that just doesn't happen. It's just a datum that there are these laws that say that kind of thing doesn't happen. The physical is closed. Yeah? So if you fix the physical, there are, there are no jabs of input from anything else. Then if you say uh, consciousness is not thereby fixed, then consciousness must be an epiphenomenon. It's making no difference to what goes on. Uh, okay. So suppose we have two different possible worlds about which Mary's physical information is correct. And suppose that in those two possible worlds, people have different experiences of red. If that were true, would supervenience be true? Very good. <laughs> right. Uh, exactly right. Um, so the mental doesn't supervene in the physical, if that's right. If you can have the same physical stuff, but different mental stuff. Um, there is going to be a question why you say that's um, uh, uh, that the sensation of redness is being rooted in one um, this pattern of cell firing rather than another. And the point we went over a couple of sessions ago is that there is a kind of unintelligibility about that. 
Why redness rather than greenness being correlated with this pattern of cell firings is not like the average speed of motion of molecules being correlated with water boiling. Um, that's what makes it seem possible that the mental could come apart from the physical in the way it does. Actually, can I just take one last vote on this? Could you have two different possible worlds in which everything physical is the same, but all the qualia are different? Put out your hand if you think the answer is yes. And if you think that, uh, yeah? Okay, let, let's just pause a bit. <laughs> People are slowly, okay? And if you think the answer is no, and if you have no idea what the question is about, okay, and if you didn't understand the question perfectly well, but you just don't know what the answer is, <laughs> I would say it's, a, it's, it's not quite a third, a third, a third, <laughs> but, okay, yeah. Yes? What do you mean the same thing? So like, Physically the same. Yeah. Isn't it possible? Well, that's, a, <laughs> that's, that's, a, <laughs> that's what I was asking. I was hoping to get the answer from you. <laughs> well, yeah, like two people, like two, two people could sit and watch a movie in like totally different experiences depending on like how they felt before the movie or whatever. Um, yeah, but remember everything about them is physically exactly the same over, 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 over a long period here, yeah? It's not just that they're watching the same movie. Their brains, uh, down to the finest level, are exactly the same. Yep? Well, what about identical twins that have different personalities? Identical twins with different so personalities. Exactly the same, but they might act in different ways, right? Sure, yeah. Th that tells you that, um, the, the, the identical twins tells you that everything could be physically very similar, even though um, uh, there's quite a lot of psychological variation, right? That's your, that's your point, yeah. Supervenience is saying um, something much more demanding. It's saying everything physical is exactly the same, right? It's not just identical twins. I mean, <laughs> identical twins can be very similar. These are really, really similar, right? Every glue on isn't exactly the same. Um, well, <laughs> I don't really have the technical vocabulary to explain this properly, but every, every gluon is exhibiting exactly the same physical characteristics in those two twins. It, yeah. Um, th th that's much, a, a much closer similarity than you'd get in, 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 with real twins. Yeah. I mean, one's got their arm in the air, the other's got their arm down. That's enough of a difference. One atom different and all the bets are off. They might be psychologically quite different, so far as this kind of physicalism goes. Yeah. OK. So OK, that's great. So it's very clear what that formulation of physicalism is saying. Um, what, we, what makes people say you could have the same physical properties with different psychology is ideas like um, uh, your spectrum, the spectrum of the person in one world might be an inversion of the spectrum in a person in another world. Or uh, you could have physically identical people in one world uh, to another, where in the one world they're zombies, and in the other case they're like you or me. But as this last, uh, as a question, last questioner uh, but one said, um, if everything physical is the same, then the, all the causal processes are going to be the same through all these possible worlds even though the qualia are different. So if physicalism is false, then epiphenomenalism is true. Yeah? If the mental is not just physical, if the mental is not supervenient in the physical, then the mental can only be epiphenomenal. Yeah? And the monkey and the tiger thing is right. OK. Yep? Uh, I didn't see the connection between <coughs> Uh-huh. Uh, which connection? The connection be so the, the, the top thing is saying, um, suppose that you don't have supervenience. Yeah? That's to say, suppose everything physical could be the same, even though the qualia are different. Then if everything physical is, is the same, um, the whole mighty machine of the universe goes on uh, in just the same way. Yeah? Um, 
And that difference in conscious state is making no difference to what happens. So the difference in conscious state is causally inert. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't make anything different. All that's making a difference is the physical stuff. So if you say the mind can't be reduced to the physical, the price you pay is that you buy into that picture of the monkey on the tiger, and you say the mind doesn't do anything. If the mind is physical, then of course the mind can be making stuff happen. It's just more physical stuff. Oh, it's part of the physical universe. It makes stuff happen the way everything else makes stuff happen. Plain as day. OK, so I think that's a better explanation of physicalism than anything we had so far. And that's how um, uh, some of these questions about clearly are look when you think of it like that. OK? This is your last chance. Well, it's actually not your last chance. But <laughs> this is one of your many chances to raise questions about this. OK. Imagination. Imagination. OK, so imagination is the big puzzle for um, uh, physicalism. Even put in terms of supervenience, imagination is the big puzzle. And this is, this is Nagel. I think um, this is Nagel's great point. If the subjective character of experience is fully comprehensible from only one point of view, and that's the key thing, fully comprehensible from only one point of view, then any shift to greater objectivity, <laughs> that is less attachment to a specific viewpoint. If you try to get an objective, scientific, or physical understanding of the thing, that doesn't take you closer to the real nature of the phenomenon. It takes you further away from it. And at present, we are completely unequipped to think about the subjective character of experience without relying on imagination, without taking up the point of view of the experiential subject. And the key word there, I think, is imagination. Um, and that's what is so strange about the mind. If it's all physical, then surely we can understand it all objectively. How could there be a sector of the world out there that you can only access by way of imagination? But that's just the way it seems to be. I mean, that, that is actually, it seems to me that is completely the state of the current debate. The, on the one hand, there are people who say, it's got to be all physical. Of course it's physical. And then there are the people who say, but um, you can't understand it without relying on imagination. How could that be if it was all physical? Um, there, must be, <laughs> there must be some other way of getting at it. I mean, we've got a, <laughs> we've got a bit of the world here. Um, we've got the mind here. We can get at it by imagination. There must be some other way we can get at it, but we have no idea how to do that. That's the puzzling thing. How can that be? How could it be that we, we are trapped in uh, relying on imagination to understand this? Well, here's one way to think about it. You might think <coughs> imagination. Well, what is imagination anyway? Imagination has to do with the format in which we have our knowledge. You could get the same facts presented in lots of different formats. So isn't um, imagination just one format among many? And you can have imaginative knowledge of someone else's mental states. And you can have an objective knowledge of their physiology, the way they're functionally organized, and so on. Couldn't that just be the same thing out there that you're getting knowledge of in two different ways? You're getting knowledge of it in two different formats, just as you might get knowledge of something by being told about it or knowledge of it by being shown a photograph. So you're getting the knowledge of the same aspect of the person. There's the same thing there, only now you've got an imaginative understanding of it. Now you've got a physiological understanding of it. And let me give an example. Here's, uh, here's the imagination at work. Suppose I ask you, is that block on the left, is that the same as the block on the right? Who said yes? <laughs> Anyone else? Anyone else think it's yes? Anyone think it's no? <coughs> yes is the right answer. 
Um, <laughs> how did you do that? Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. You did it in your head, right? Um, I mean, there are really lot. I mean, let me just make the first of all the point. First of all, this is not an isolated example, right? You can really know that these are the same just by looking at it. And what you did was you kind of mentally rotated it, right? You kind of you turned it over in your mind. Um, uh, there are lots and lots. <laughs> you could have many happy hours with these diagrams. Yeah, um, um, is the one on the left the same as the one on the right? I make the top one the same, is that right? Yeah, yeah. I make the middle one the, <laughs> I think that's the same. Yeah, and I think the bottom two are different. Yeah, that one sticks out the wrong way uh, if you turn it around, <laughs> right? Okay, so what are you doing there? You are using your imagination, <laughs> right? Um, I mean, these, these examples, uh, uh, you may know this, but um, Shepard, and, uh, who, who started the study of the, how people do these tasks, found a basic fact that um, there's the angle, you, when you mentally rotate, you have to mentally rotate this one to see if it's the same as that one. Yeah. So with these diagrams, you can vary the angle of rotation. Yeah. And Shepard found that um, the time it takes you to give the right answer is directly proportionate to the angle of rotation. Think about that. <laughs> that means you're rotating the thing at a definite velocity <laughs> in your mind, right? Um, they also did stuff with, uh, I, 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 I mean, once Shepard found this, of course, <laughs> hundreds of people started working on it. And there are basic findings like, you ask people to imagine an elephant, now zoom in in the head, now zoom in on the foot. It takes you longer to zoom in in the foot because it's smaller. Right, you, <laughs> you're zooming in at a definite speed. Anyway, <laughs> so that is clearly imagination, right? Now you're getting knowledge of the world here, and this is really important for in just an everyday life. If I'm asking something like, how can I get out of the door quickly? Uh, yeah, then I've got to imagine going this way or going that way. If you're just trying to park a car, you're using imagination in this sense. If you're trying to get a shopping cart through a narrow space, you're using imagination in that sense. It, yeah, it, it really matters. So that's one format in which you have your knowledge of the world, imagination. But in principle, you could have done that kind of task, uh, sorry, this kind of task here. There are lots of ways you could have done it. You could have written down equations for those two shapes, yeah, and found if, you, if there's a, a transform. Um, of one shape into the other. You could have used analytical geometry. You could have run a computer program. Um, you could have made physical models of those two shapes to turn and turn one to see if it maps onto the other. Um, so it's the same thing you'd be finding out about through imagination as through analytical geometry or running a computer program. Doing it in your imagination, is, as, as you all demonstrated there, that's really fast, slick, efficient. If you're going for real world, real time, kind of um, get me an answer quick kind of procedures, that's much more efficient than doing analytical geometry. You'd have to be crazy to start writing down equations there, given that when you can do it so much better and faster um, using your imagination. But still, uh, these others are all valid ways of finding out the same thing. So. Couldn't you make a similar distinction to that between having an imaginative knowledge of someone else's mind and having an objective description of someone else's mind? I mean, suppose that you think now not about geometrical shapes, but about two faces. And you think, look at that sad, puzzled face on the left. Look at that happy, optimistic face on the right. How did you get from one to the other? Right? You can use imagination there. You can say, what's the inner life there like? And <laughs> as you said, do that thing where you, <laughs> where you flip your imagination to get the dynamics from the one state to the other. So you could think, look, imagining is just one format in which we have knowledge of other people. And just as with the blocks, there's that capacity for visualization and rotation. 
So similarly, you could say, um, how can you make that sad face happy? Yeah? How could you do it? Well, you just <laughs> do that flip in your head. That's what your imaginative understanding of other people is for, letting you do that fast, efficient, real-time engagement. That's what you need for ordinary social interaction. I mean, just as with the analytical geometry, you could write down equations for these two things, or you could do a physiological description here, but that is slow, laborious, inefficient. You'll get there in the end. It's valid to do it physiologically. But um, you have at your disposal, nature has given you a much faster, more effective way of getting the right answer quickly. Uh, yeah. Yes. Do you think that would have set meaning? Right. In particular, because of, because of the aspect Very good. Of yes. Um, so in that case, I'm only limited to things that have set meaning yep. in my imagination versus for someone else it could be different in terms of what it said. I agree. Uh, I, I, I strongly agree. But OK, so I, I mean, let me come clean and say that the situation in the left here is more complex than the situation in the right. right? It's not, it's not that simple. But I think this is nonetheless quite a good model. Um, that uh, if you even think about turning the cubes, that if you, that, that's the kind of thing you get better at with practice. right? You recognize that there are trick cases that fool you and so on. Yeah? Similarly, with getting an imaginative understanding of other people, um, uh, I mean, partly, you wouldn't try and do it. In real life, you'd be doing, if you're doing this with a friend of yours, someone you know well, you know a whole lot more about the context and background than I, I'm just showing you a couple of photos. I'm trying to show you evocative enough photographs that you can easily engage. You, you, you see what I mean? Um, but um, in real life, you've got a lot more than that to go on. And of course, there are limits to your imaginative understanding of other people. And it seems to me, uh, there are three levels in your imaginative understanding of other people. There's what, there's what you're born with, the, what is, uh, the, the, the kind of thing that even a child of a few months will have by way of picking up on uh, distress or contentment in their caregiver. Um, and then there's something you get from culture and learning, like reading novels, presumably. I mean, people always say that reading novels is very good for you and very improving. And, why that should be is never really adequately explained. I mean, um, you, you know, there you are navigating the ordinary social world, and you read a whole bunch of book, books about people that never existed, and that's supposed to help you understand other people better. How is that? How, how does that work? Um, and it must be something like training the imagination. Yeah? You're learning to expand. And a third level is the kind of thing I was talking about on Tuesday um, with psychiatric patients where you can start out thinking, I can't have any imaginative understanding of this person at all. Is it like a bat? It's so alien to my, anything from my background or my experiences. But you can do it. So I don't think, I, I, I see why you say you're confined, because so often we're very aware of these limits and what we can empathize with. But I think the truth is that we're, we're relatively elastic about that. We get a lot better at it over time. The third one, um, when you have that level of scientific expansion, like I was talking about last time with schizophrenic patients or with um, patients with delusional moods and the violins going off and the dopamine neurons and all that, do, do, you remember? Yeah, that, that kind of thing was the third one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes, that's right. I, I, well, I don't want to blur what I just said to the last questioner with what I'm saying to your questioner. Um, I, I, what I was saying to the last questioner was um, you can use the scientific results to improve your capacity for imaginative understanding. Or, uh, but the other thing you can do is treat it like analytic geometry. Just do the physiology, forget about the mental life, and that will still give you answers as to how you get from this face to that face. But, um, they will just be very slow, inefficient, and um, unreasonably detailed answers. You know, answers that have far more detail about the biology than you really wanted to know. Yeah, they're, they're not relevant. 
Um, so what you've got, just as you've got a very fast, slick way of finding whether this shape is that, you've got a very fast, slick way in imagination of finding how you get from this state to that. Um, but it's not that there's some new sector of reality here. It's not that what you're dealing with here when you visualize rotating this thing is dealing with a different sector of reality than analytic geometry deals with. You're both just talking about shapes. It's just the same thing. So it's just the same thing here. It's just the same physical system that you're dealing with. You just get two different formats in which you can represent information about it. So you could think of the analogy like this. Analytical geometry is the science of shapes. That explains why some transformations are possible and others are not, why you can get from some shapes and not. But imagining is just a fast, slick, folk way of doing it. Yeah? If you really want to understand the nature of shapes, you have to do geometry. Um, but so you could think, look, imagining is just a folk way of going about understanding the mind. If you want deep explanations here, then fair enough, you want to get beyond imagining. You've got to do uh, scientific psychology. Um, you've got to do functionalist psychology or maybe physiological psychology, maybe both. Do all the boxes and arrows in a, uh, uh, from a scientific diagram, find out exactly what physiology is implementing those boxes and arrows. That's the real truth about what is actually going on. But imagining is this very fast, slick way of getting at it. You see what I mean? So that's a fully physicalist picture that gives a role to imagining. The trouble from Nagel's point of view is in this case, in the case of um, the blocks, the real truth, the real facts here are what analytical geometry tells you. You, you see what I mean? If you, if, some people are not very good at visualizing. Some people are really good at visualizing. If you're not good at visualizing at all, you could still know all about shapes and what they are. You just wouldn't have this fast, slick way of getting at when two shapes are the same. But if you apply that analogy here, then suppose you can't, you suppose you just don't have any empathy. You can't ever get behind someone else's point of view. You can't ever see the world from someone else's perspective. But you're a real whiz at physiology. Then you should still have a deep understanding of what's going on um, with them. It's, it's not that um, you, you, there's just this fast, slick way of getting at things that you haven't got. And I think. So imagining will be just our folk way of going about psychology, functionalism or physical psychology. That will give the deep explanations about the mind. But that's where you see the force of Nagel's thing. The subjective character of experience, he's saying, is fully comprehensible only from one point of view. And if you um, try and be objective, if you try and move to objectivity, that does not take you closer to the real nature of the phenomenon, it takes you further away from it. So Nagel's picture is just the opposite of the one I just said, that um, imagining is just a fast, slick way of doing something that in principle you could do just as well by doing, or even better, by doing physiology. Nagel's saying imagining is what takes you to the real nature of the thing. And if you do physiology, you've just left the mind behind. So. Um, this way of thinking about things says that uh, imagination, that's really a, something about the format. It's not telling you about a new sector of reality. It's not giving you uh, information about something new. It's just giving you the information in a new format. Um, Nagel's way of thinking about things is no. It, imagining isn't giving you stuff just in a new format. Imagining is telling you about something that you couldn't even glimpse the existence of without the use of imagination. Okay. Can you put your hand up if your kind of gut is on Nagel's side in this? It's really all about imagining in the end. And if you think, no, it's, uh, imagining is just a fast, slick thing. It's like the geometry case. I was hoping for more, <laughs> more on the side of the geometry. Is that it for the geometry three? OK, <laughs> well, I'm glad you're here, guys. <laughs> OK, OK, but that's important anyway. I think this is a real issue. Austin, do you want to comment on that? Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, Nagel has this metaphor in the 
with that paper about um, referential paths converging. Yes. And that's what you're addressing. Referential paths converging. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. what you're addressing here. And so I don't see the motivation for thinking that sort of the referential path that proceeds imaginatively is somehow subordinate from our understanding of the same thing when it's got through these analytical, physiological, functional. Yeah. It's, it's, we're still just understanding um, the, the same thing, so I don't see the sort of motivation for prioritizing one over the other. Right. Why say one's better than the other? Yeah. Yeah. And that's the first point I was thinking about. And then the second point is that, like, there's a slide on here where it says, like, couldn't it be that, um, you know, uh, the thing that we're understanding imaginatively is just the same thing that these scientists yeah. are saying. Yeah. And the response to that is like, sure, that could be. And so that's a like, way of like fending off the dualists from all of these arguments that we've been, yeah. that we've been looking at. But that's right. That's a way of fending but, off dualism, yeah. Right. But the thing is, like, and that's the rub. You've got to make good on that. And it just seems completely unintelligible that what we learn about when we open a, a psychology textbook is the same thing, or when we crack open someone's skull and look at their brain, is just the same thing that uh, 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 we get when we sort of introspect and think about our own mental lives. And that's like the baffling part. And so yes. that's what Nagel's talking about when he talks about the, the pre-Socratic philosophers with like the matter and the energy. So you think, yeah. sure, maybe this, this picture could be right, but we have no clue how it could be. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that's right. I, 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 I think if you bought my fast slick, my, my model of the, my geometrical model here, then it would be intelligible. I think that would really help. I've, well, <laughs> three of you thought that would really help. <laughs> Anyhow, um, um, I, I, I find that a little bit helpful. I mean, at any rate, in understanding how it might go, that, I mean, if you think about it from an evolutionary point of view, then it really makes perfect sense. Other people are very, very complex organisms. You've got to negotiate with other people. If you had to negotiate with other people purely as physical organisms, you'd really be in trouble um, because they just don't behave predictably. Yeah, I mean, uh, boop, boop. <laughs> did you know I was going to do that? Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> you, you see what I mean? If, 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 you, if you just try and treat people physically, you would need such a fantastic amount of information about them and such um, high levels of computational ability to do, to do all the math, to predict what they're going to do next, that it really would be impossible. You need, we'd need far bigger brains than we have to do that. So instead, suppose we have this fast, slick way, this ability to um, simulate or imagine other people, and we just use that to negotiate with them. Now that's going to be, as, uh, as you put it, a, a subordinate referential path. It's just what nature gives you as a way of coping with this very complex environment, all these other people. Um, uh, it's really subordinate. It has no authority because it's just, what should I say? It's just a collection of fast and dirty tricks that nature has given you to let you negotiate this complex physical environment. Yeah? Um, so I think from a theoretical point of view, this geometrical model makes perfect sense. Um, and when you say, yes, but you've completely lost, you, you haven't, you know, Nagel's thing, you haven't got to the real nature of the mind um, when you shift to the physiology, that's what you're saying. Um, the real nature of the mind was given to you with the imagination and is really puzzling how the mind can be anything else. Maybe that sense is just a hallucination. I mean, maybe that's just, look, if you think about creatures of the kind I described, who are just using a collection of fast and dirty tricks to negotiate with one another, that nonetheless, that package of fast and dirty tricks plays such a big role in your life that you find it impossible to accept that is really just a way of thinking about physiology. You revere it. You know, it plays a big role in your own motivations and all that. But at the end of the day, there's nothing there but the physiology. Yeah, so and you taking yourself too seriously, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Sorry, I don't, mean, <laughs> I don't mean you, I mean one taking oneself too seriously. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that seems right. So like folk psychology is this extremely powerful thing. Yes. Like but the trick is the, the trick is to to say no folk psychology that's real that's powerful work it, it traffics in you know beliefs and others these things are real but you have to show how 
you know, the stuff that you're talking about at the folk psychological level actually hooks up with the stuff that you're talking about at the, at the physical Absolutely, level. And, yeah. And, so, and that's what I was saying was the rub, to just see how, where, how those two well, 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 kind yeah. of merge. Yeah. Uh, Jackson. Yeah. Just to, to make sure I what that causes us to I think that, like, uh, we have this, this proposal that um, there's two different ways of getting at the very same thing. Uh, dualists or some, someone who's sympathetic pushes back by saying that um, it's actually unintelligible to think about like what that, uh, um, how these two different ways can be actually captured, or these two different ways of getting at the same thing really could be getting at the same thing. Um, mm -hmm. And then I, I guess I'm not quite sure I, I see what the I guess problem is with you at that point is because uh, the I guess earlier one of these slides you had something about um, it is it's intelligible to us to talk about um, oh sorry it's intelligible to us to talk about how. Uh, m molecules moving at a certain um, speed gets you boiling water. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, but it's unintelligible. It's, maybe it's on the dualist uh, rhetoric doesn't seem to be unintelligible how uh, my experience of red is getting at the same thing that yeah. the wavelength of, of light coming off the rotor. Yes, right, at. right. Um, and I guess uh, I wasn't sure. It seems maybe uh, what's, supposed to be un what's supposed to be very intelligible about the Comcast case? You might just think, so here's the way to say that it's mm. actually unintelligible. There's just two different properties. There's boiling. Yes. Uh, and there's the, um, the average speed of uh, the, the molecules. Uh, yeah. I can observe that this happens. I can describe the relationship, but I don't know why this law holds. I don't know, I don't know why. <laughs> why is it that um, uh, the, the universe is structured the way it is? It just is yeah. that way. And okay, yeah. Well, uh, l let me put it. Uh, suppose I talk about the hard-nosed evolutionist. On the one hand, yeah. Th does that make sense at this point in the, in the discussion if I talk about the hard-nosed evolutionist? The hard-nosed evolutionist says, we're all just physiological symptom, s systems. Um, we're all just physiological systems, and, but we have to negotiate with one another successfully. And so evolution gives us this package of imagination and talk about the mind as a way of simplifying um, uh, uh, our, our, our thinking about each other just as we've got this ability to visualize shapes rotating, we've got this ability to put ourselves into the shoes of other people. Right? It's just a way of getting on in a complex physical world. Now, call that, let, let's call that an error theory. That says, um, when you take the stuff about imagination and the mind very seriously, and you think you're talking about the real nature of some phenomenon here, you're just taking yourself too seriously. Um, it's as if you said the real nature of the shapes is given by visualization and imagination and, and what I can rotate, not by analytic, not by this so-called scientific analytical geometry. I don't hold with that at all. The, <laughs> then you'd be taking the folk stuff about shapes too seriously. Really, the analytical geometry does tell you the truth about shapes. Um, and on the other hand, there's the picture that Nagel has that I think is the common sense one that. Uh, uh, no, the stuff about imagination and empathy is really important. I mean, this is what matters most in life. Everything else only matters because it connects back to the psychological. Um, uh, th th that, is, that is where everything else starts. So how could the real nature of some physiological phenomenon be being revealed to you by imagination? That, that's what makes this unintelligible. Yeah, this real nature is given to you by the imagination, but yet you can do this physiological thing. D does that help? That's, that's how I was picturing it being set up. OK, okay I, I really want to whiz through some stuff now. Um, we have 10 minutes left. Is that all right? I, I, I have a sense of fatigue in there. But <laughs> Um, can you bear it if we whiz through some stuff ju uh, just to wrap up? Okay, fasten your seatbelts. Um, okay, I want to talk about w uh, another aspect of what imagining is. Uh, I mean, it really seems to be important in this discussion. Um, uh, and I want to th think about uh, how important the environment is in imagining. It's natural to think of putting yourself in someone else's shoes as getting inside their head, seeing the world be from behind the furry brow, 
from um, you know, g getting yourself inside someone else's mind. But th I think that's not really the right way to think of it. Here's an example. Suppose you're a stage designer, but your task is just to hammer together a set for a stage play. But suppose that the auditorium, suppose that work is being done in the auditorium, so you can't get into the auditorium. Um, you just have to imagine what the set's going to look like from different point of view, points of view. You have to imagine what's it going to look like from up here. Will you get a clear view from over here? Will it be? Will it seem very cluttered if you're down here? Um, uh, if someone's standing over here, will they be visible from down here once I've got the set going? Well, that's imagination, right? That you're trying to imagine what people are going to see from different points in the auditorium. Um, you're imagining how the set will look from different positions in the theater. And what you're doing there is there's something in the real world, something in the physical environment, and you're trying to imagine of it how it will look to people from here or there. Right? I mean, in my humble way, I think about this with the slides, right? How will that look from a distance? Will that be, is that text too small, right? We, we all do this the whole time. Um, you're trying to do a drawing, you're trying to do a painting. You're imagining, how will that look to someone? Um, you're just deciding how to wear, what to wear. How will that look to, 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 to someone? Um, so you can be imagining this from lots of different perspectives that you don't yourself occupy. Now, the set is there as an element in your imaginative exercise. Um, it's not that you're trying to imagine that something elusive or hidden here. I mean, you, you, you're talking about people's relations to this external structure. You, first of all, you identify the thing in the world, and then you ask, how will all these people be related to it? Now, um, I think in the way that we start to learn about other minds is not really first by getting inside other people's heads. Um, what you find out about is, what's the environment that you and the other person occupy? There's um, uh, Moll and Meltzoff in a recent paper talk about, uh, these are developmental psychologists, talk about joint attention, joint engagement. It's this basic thing that young children do of getting to the phase where they, uh, 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 around, what is it, 12 months? Yes, about a year, that they and the caregiver um, will both look at an object and the child and the caregiver look backwards and forwards at each other and at the object. And this gives great pleasure to all concerned, right? You, you, you reference your reactions to the object and what you're doing with it. Um, uh, but there's a, this is the three mountains test uh, developed by Piaget that um, this is about a yard square uh, block with three mountains on it. And um, you put a child sitting here and a child sitting at the opposite side. And you ask the child sitting here, what was the child sitting on the opposite side seeing? And you show them um, paintings depicting what uh, the other child on the other side might be seeing. Do you see what I mean? And at an early stage, children will say, oh, is this, side, is this, this, this painting with the red and the green and the gray visible that the child on the other side is seeing? They take it for granted that the child is seeing the mountains, but they take it for granted that the child's perspective on the mountains is the same as theirs. You assume, this is like the, an earlier question, there's this early stage at which you literally assume that other people's perspectives in the world are the same as yours. Yeah? So you, you, you're shown the painting showing exactly what you see sitting here, and you say, that's what the guy sitting on the other side is seeing. It takes a while. It's an achievement to liberate yourself to the point where um, you get it. Now, the thing, is, the thing about that kind of task is you first of all get the bit of the environment that the other person is responding to, and then you imagine what their take on it is. So think about the bat. If you're going to do that kind of exercise with the bat, then the first thing you have to do is know what things and properties the bat is experiencing. Then at level two, you have to know what perspective the bat has in those things and properties. So it seems to me the fundamental problem with bats, the reason bats are so weird, is that you have no idea what it is in their environment that they're responding to. They seem to be seeing and responding to things that aren't even visible to you. 
right? I mean, they're going after bugs. What do you care about bugs? I mean, you know, unless they're particularly big and scary. You, you, you know, bats are really caring about bugs that are too small to be visible to humans. Um, they're, uh, you know, if a bat comes into a room, it does not see chairs as a relevant aspect of the scenery. Yeah? So you can't even get to level one. Your trouble with the bat is not knowing what perspective it has on the things and properties in its environment. You don't even know what its environment is in the first place. You don't even get to that stage. So what you don't know about the bat is um, not something about what's going on inside its head. What you don't know about the bat is what's its environment? I mean, in principle, given a lot of time and study, you could laboriously write this down in real time. You could, but people do try to figure out re, uh, um, uh, what, in, what aspects of the environment the bat actually is responding to. But you wouldn't get something that you could use to interact with a bat in real time. I mean, with, oops, plus, with this kind of setup, what you're getting is something where you get the other person's take on it, and now you're at the point where you can engage in games with them. You can hide things from the other person. You can reveal things to the other person. Um, you can interact successfully because you've identified, you've done this two-stage exercise. You first of all identified their environment, then their take on it. And uh, now you can interact with them in that environment. You can have a social engagement in that environment. With a bat, it's not that you don't know what's going on inside its mind. It's that you know, the, the, the thing about this picture here of the, the bat um, gazing at the flower is it looks like it's kind of sniffing it the, the, way, the way a human might be. But really, it may not even be seeing a flower at all. The, the, the salient thing for the bat may be um, a cloud of bugs. Um, and the, the flower does something off in the background, yeah, something unnoticed. You have no idea what kind of environment the bat's in. Um, that's not a matter of uh, what its perspective is, is getting to the stage of getting what the relevant objects and properties are in the first place. What's so alien and hard to understand about the bat is not what's inside its furry little head. What's so alien is what world are we in? What, what three-dimensional set of worlds of properties have we got here? So in the last 60 seconds, um, Jackson's way of formulating physicalism was all the correct information is physical information, and there's dear old Mary um, with all the, OK. But when Mary, what happens when Mary steps out? When Mary steps out, the first thing she finds out, and we, we, we spent some time in this in class, the first thing she finds out is, is kind of like the set or the mountains. The first thing she finds out is about the colors. The first thing she finds out about is not mental at all. She finds out a new fact about the non-mental environment, namely all the colors. She first grasps what the colors of all the objects are. And now she's got that scaffolding that understanding of what the environment is. And then within that scaffolding, she can start to imagine the scene from different perspectives. But that suggests, it seems to me, that Mary may just be getting, um, the, 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 well, the knowledge of what, what it's like to see color wasn't part of her physical information. But uh, uh, what Mary's getting is just something about what the environment is and what other people's perspectives are on it. I'm sorry, we're right on time, and I'm aware that you have other classes to go to. But let me see. Um, you could think what Mary's getting here is information in a new format about other, what she can do now. She's got the color, and now she can imagine other people's take on the color. But it's like this. It's like being able to play basketball, either uh, being, able to th uh, being able to understand basketball either as a commentator or as a player. That um, um, what Mary's getting is a real-time ability to interact with other people using this fast, slick visualization of their experiences. She could have had that purely physiologically, but it would have been slow, laborious, and ineffective. So the argument for physical, staying with physicalism here is that 
Uh, you can think that what Mary is getting is information in a new format about something that she could have had otherwise. Okay, thank you. That, a bit hasty at the end, but that's the end of the message. Thank you. <laughs>